All right, Braves fans, let's get rolling. I'm George McNair, and this is State of the Braves. Well, guys, uh, as the offseason has begun a little too early for the Braves this time around, they have quickly fired uh, hitting coach Kevin Seitzer, assistant hitting coach Bobby Magianis, and catching coach Sal Fasano. You know, we've talked a lot about the failures offensively of the Braves team in 2024, of course, always with uh, the perspective that uh, injuries had a lot to do with it too, but it was kind of uh, impossible to argue that this was not uh, a total uh, reversal of one of the greatest offenses, honestly, in MLB history. All the numbers back that up in 2023, and then just uh, a lot of guys um, having really, really down years um, this year. We've, we've certainly gone through all of that. So is it a shock that the Braves, uh, took this, um, took this turn and fired these, uh, particularly two hitting coaches, not necessarily, but, uh, the Braves had just had a press conference in which Snicker especially, uh, seemed to say that he wanted all his coaches back knowing Brian Snicker. That's not, uh, shocking. He's going to be loyal to his guys. Uh, Anthopolis was a little more noncommittal in, in those comments. Uh, but it certainly seemed like everybody was coming back. This coaching staff has been uh, together and very cohesive, other than, of course, uh, Wash and EY leaving uh, for better coaching opportunities last year. Uh, but, yeah, this coaching staff has really been together for a long time. Kevin Seitzer has been with the club for 10 seasons. Uh, so it, it was uh, surprising in certainly one sense, especially after their initial comments. Uh, but we, we assume that Anthopolis is running this organization. Ultimately, the decisions land with him and they probably had, uh, you know, some, uh, some meetings and some sessions in which it was just determined that a new voice was needed for the Braves. And certainly, um, you know, it's a little hard to argue that considering the, um, the performance of the Braves hitters this year. So, yeah, like I said, Seitzer was with the Braves organization for 10 seasons. He, he oversaw some of the best Braves, Braves offenses in franchise history, including that 2023 offense. Um, he was with, of course, with the team during the 2021 World Series run as well. Magianis uh, came to the Braves as Seitzer's assistant hitting coach before the 2021 season. So he was also there for the World Series run. Uh, and then Sal Fasano, you know, this one is... Maybe the the more surprising one because it's not really related to the Braves hitting woes, um, and he's always been considered someone who's very popular in the clubhouse, always spoken of in glowing terms, uh, and uh, you know his his position is more on the defensive side of the of uh, helping the catchers, uh, game planning, uh, pitch calling, all that sort of thing. Um, so. That one's a little surprising because the Braves really have not struggled in in that specific area, and yet he will not be back. The Braves do not plan to replace Fasano uh, as that position was created for him, whereas they will replace, of course, the hitting coach, and uh, they will also look for an assistant hitting coach as well. Uh, I am going to spend most of this episode focusing on this decision and how it relates to the Braves, their hitting philosophy, all those things. But I do want to go to one other bit of news um, that I found interesting, uh, and that is Jeff Francoeur's recent comments on the Foul Territory podcast with A.J. Pierzynski. Uh, Francoeur, of course, is doing the ALCS games for, I think, TBS, uh, and he has done that for the last few years. We know Francoeur is a, a great broadcaster and play-by-play -play guy. So uh, in that interview, he talked about a lot of things, but presents he also specifically asked him what the Braves' biggest offensive need was. As far as Frank Corr was concerned, he did not hesitate to say that the Braves' clearest need was they need to go out and get a shortstop. Um, and that was music to my ears. I love that Frank Corr was that bold about it. He didn't mince words. He gave his opinion. Um, and that's one reason I really like Frank Corr. Uh, he's not afraid to just say it. Um, and so, look, I mean, you know, you guys know where I stand with Arcia. Another year with, let's be honest, a backup shortstop in Orlando Arcia. Yeah, he's he's fine as your backup. He's fine as your um, your extra infielder. But as your starting shortstop, he's just proven over the last year and a half that he's just not there, especially for a team hoping to win a World Series. 
So yeah, bringing back Arcia to me just cannot happen. I mean, they might do it. You know, they might bolster the team and all these other ways that they could and just roll with him again. But I would be pretty disappointed with that decision. And I appreciate that Frank Hoare is on board with me on that one. Uh, so Frank Hoare specifically mentioned two names, Willie Adamas. We talked about Adamas uh, last episode as a potential though unlikely um, target for the Braves because he's a free agent. He's going to be really expensive. Uh, he would probably be the highest paid Brave if they went out and got him on the free agent market. It's hard for me to uh, imagine Willie Adamas coming in as a free agent, making more money than, um, you know, Austin Riley or Matt Olson or Chris Sale or fill in the blank of uh, whoever you want to. Um, I mean, could that happen? The Braves just determine this is the best opportunity. Let's just go do it. Yeah, it could. Um, I think it's the the less likely scenario. But Frank Orr also mentioned a name that I should have mentioned last episode and didn't. And um, a guy that I actually do, I do like this idea, and that's Bo Bichette of the Toronto Blue Jays. So Bichette has been a really good all-star caliber player for the Blue Jays over the last three or four years. Uh, he has one year left on uh, his contract. The The Blue Jays are going through this. You know, this might be the last year of a window for them because both Bichette and Vladimir Guerrero Jr. just have one year left. Uh, so they might be open to kind of a reboot and uh, trading Bichette in the offseason. They they haven't really said that they're going to do that, though they, they wouldn't say that. So it's an interesting uh, thing to think about uh, regarding Bichette. Um, he's coming off a terrible offensive season, but, but to defend him a little bit, it was also a season full of injuries. He had like four different random injuries crop up throughout the year. So it's kind of hard to judge him too harshly. He only hit like two, 225 this season. Um, and it was actually slightly a negative war player. So it was not a good year for Bichette to say the least. But again, that is not the player he has been over the course of his career. So before 2024, Bichette has three straight seasons of top 20 MVP seasons. Uh, his batting average, he's always hit around 300, which is music to my ears because the Braves just don't have that in the lineup other than a great year from Ozuna here uh, this, this past season. His on-base percentage is around 340, which is not super high for a guy with a uh, 300 batting average. So he's not going to take a ton of walks. But, you know, that's around what Austin Riley is in terms of on-base percentage. So he's still getting on base some. He's got some good speed. He's a solid defender. Uh, he's maybe slightly down from what you're getting with Arcia. So he's not an elite defender, but he's also not really going to hurt you in the field. Um, and if healthy, again, he's one of the best offensive shortstops in baseball. So I really like uh, Bo Bichette. He's... Um, He's relatively young. He's only 26. He'll be 27 uh, entering next season. So that is certainly a, a, still a big window uh, of, uh, you know, potentially his prime years for the Brave. And so it does seem like a really good candidate for the Braves. If they're willing to pay up, he would be expensive uh, for sure. But it just seems like a good trade candidate because, you know, the Braves typically, I mean, this kind of did this with Murphy, right? You you trade for the guy, you immediately extend him. I don't know if he would be willing to be extended at this point. Um, you know, he's coming off of a down year. He might just want to play out, um, play out this season and then go to free agency. So, um, you know, on that end, it, it actually might make him a little cheaper to go out and get because you maybe are only getting one year of him. I do kind of wonder if the Braves would only do this if they knew that they could extend the guy. Um, I don't know if you can know that for sure before you make the deal. Uh, but all that being said, I do think Bo Bichette uh, is, uh, is a good trade candidate. I gave you guys a, a list of a couple other guys that I might target. Uh, Hassan Kim is another free agent. Um, uh, Ezekiel Tovar from uh, the Rockies, but Boba Shett would be, I think, above those guys, certainly, especially offensively. All right, so now let me uh, pivot back and focus the rest of the episode on the firing of Kevin Seitzer, as well as his outgoing comments to Dave O'Brien um, after his firing. He was able to speak to the Braves beat reporter, David O'Brien, who works for The Athletic. So, Sizer said a few interesting things to O'Brien that I think put some things into perspective and is worth talking about. 
Uh, one of the things that came out in the, that interview is that Seitzer, very unfortunately, his wife had suffered a uh, pretty serious illness uh, during this past season that he admitted took a lot of his focus away from the team. And we can certainly um, understand that. And, um, you know, you, you can't blame Seitzer um, for putting his focus there. And we certainly uh, will hopefully that whole situation is uh, past them and, and she's healthy and, and okay. But, but, you know, my biggest criticism of Seitzer this year um, wasn't necessarily the overall performance of the offense. Uh, I don't know that he can take on the, the full responsibility of that. But I did, and I've said this before, uh, my biggest criticism was that the team did not look ready to start the year. Um, you know, they just, um, it, exiting spring training, entering the season, lots of batting stance issues, mechanical issues. Some of those things were really never resolved or, or not resolved by Seitzer. I mean, uh, Riley mid, midway through the year finally gets his stance back, but it was from an old hitting coach, an old coach. Um, you know, Matt Olson really never figured out his, his issues. And I mean, that's partly the, the responsibility of the hitting coach, right. To get those guys back on track. So, you know, maybe this lack of focus and again, understandable is because of his, his wife's, um, uh, illness. And you certainly have to put some of the blame on the players too. I mean, they should know their swings and be able to adjust and and come up with some solutions as well. Uh, but the fact is, Seitzer wasn't really uh, helping out. It didn't seem like he was able to help out much in that regard. Uh, Seitzer's most interesting comments, however, to me, included that he was unable to break through the player's defeated attitude. I, I don't know if he used that word, but this, that's the word I'm using. The player's defeated attitude as more and more players went down with injury over the season. Basically, and it's human nature, but basically the players started pressing, trying to do too much, uh, not following the game plan, uh, chasing pitches uh, because they're trying to do too much, and that he could not overcome that mental hurdle with the team. So, I think that's something that has, I mean, we've talked about it some, but probably hasn't been fully appreciated, uh, the, the level of mental stress that was put on this team uh, from an offensive standpoint. Uh, you know, so many people think, and, and we'll all remember the, um, in the offseason, this past offseason, we all wanted the Braves to get um, a little more gritty. They, you know, get players that had, were more brash that had an edge and we kept bringing up Jock Peterson as a good example of that type of player and the different attitude that the 2021 Braves had compared to 2022 and 2023. And I'm going to be honest, I think uh, they did not solve um, that, you know, whatever they were missing there uh, in their clubhouse. I don't think they solved it in 2024 as well. And I think some of their inability to overcome uh, their issues this year was, in relation to that. So, uh, but I will say this, I think, um, we need to be more specific when we talk about what the 2021 Braves had, uh, and you could say in connection to Jock Peterson, but I think he's just one example. I think that team was just full of confidence and they had a total lack of a fear of failure. Uh, you know, they had been through the ringer that year. The first half of the year was just all about struggle and some injury and, and, of course, losing Ronald Acuna. Um, but by the time that team got to the postseason, they were just brimming with confidence. And it was like no matter what happened in a game, that team believed that someone in the lineup would come through. Uh, they were never out of a game. If they went down early in a game, it, it, it wasn't a big deal. They were going to come through no matter what. So if you go back, you know, w watch the 2021 postseason highlights or whatever, watch those games or on YouTube. I mean, it just comes across. Uh, the Braves went down in multiple games in, in that postseason. No big deal, right? Big moments. No big deal. It was like almost an assumption that they were going to come through. And that belief just totally was absent uh, in the 2024 season. And again, you, you understand it uh, on, on a human level. You know, you, you go through all of these different um, frustrations and disappointments and your teammates are, are going down like flies. <laughs> and, uh, so you understand it, but it's just a fact that that belief, and I think this is what Seitzer is getting to, is just, it was gone. 
the 2024 team, like many of us fans, uh, were defeated, right, by this rash of injuries, but they were defeated as much mentally as physically. And I think we just focus on the physical aspect and and missing big players, and that is certainly understandable. Um, I mean, that is the the biggest loss, but um, the the ability for a team to bounce back mentally and overcome some things, you certainly want that. Um, and I think this team, over time, it just it wore on them more and more. And and the evidence was certainly there. The chasing pitches outside of the zone in a way that they didn't do in 2023, right? Everybody, everybody was coming through and they were relaxed and they didn't have to chase because if they took a walk, the next guy was going to come up and do damage. And this season, they didn't do that. They didn't trust the teammates behind them to come through. So they're chasing pitches. They're not sticking to the game plan. And they had lost total confidence and trust in their teammates so they started to dr- to try to do too much when i think about you know good sports psychology and how y- you really have to go at um anything in terms of competition um i think about the jordan principle i don't know if you've ever heard michael jordan talk about how he prepared for games and how particularly how he viewed taking the last shot. We knew Jordan was always going to take the last shot, kind of like Kobe. They, they, no matter what, they were going to take the last shot. And um, if you, if you listen to what he says, he was relaxed in those moments and he was relaxed in those moments for specific reasons. He basically said, you prepare your butt off, um, which brings you confidence, right? You, you are confident because you're, you're prepared. Uh, you do your best. Uh, you control what you can control. Uh, there's no fear of failure because the worst thing uh, that can happen is that you lose. But you know, putting that into perspective, putting failure into perspective is that failure is not the worst thing in the world. In fact, it's very a very common thing and it's going to happen. But you just step up, you're prepared, you're confident, you do your best. And if you fail, you'll be back next time and do it again. And there were certainly periods of failure in Jordan's early career, uh, but you're more likely to be successful when you get out of your own head um, and you just do it and you're not worried about failure. And uh, so I think this, this team, you know, the Braves team was praised for not cratering and they made the playoffs. I mean, they, they needed some help to make the playoffs from the Diamondbacks. They did make the playoffs, and I think there's reason to applaud them for what they did accomplish. And yet, I also think it's reasonable to say that they didn't fully overcome their injuries, right? They 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 left. um, They didn't fully overcome their injuries, and they didn't raise their game to another level. Um, And you know that's hard to do. It's it's. I'm not saying that most teams would do that, but it's something that you hope your team is going to do, and they just weren't able to do it this season. So I don't I don't solely blame Kevin Seitzer. I don't mostly blame Kevin Seitzer. I think there was some things that he didn't do well this season. But remember, he was the 2023. What did he win? He won like Coach of the Year in 2023 for, of course, for the Braves' offensive success. He had done great things in Atlanta, and I generally liked what he was doing in Atlanta before 2024. Um, maybe it was just you know the fact of his wife's illness, and he was just more absent mentally, or maybe actually physically absent from the team. Some I don't know, but. Again, I don't mostly blame Seitzer. I do think it is generally a failure of the coaching staff and of the organization as a whole, right? You just view them as a whole, and um, they didn't they didn't inspire this team. So a lot has been made of the Braves, again, not collapsing. They still made the playoffs with all of their injuries, but is that the only standard for success? Uh, aren't, aren't your coaches supposed to inspire you, right? Aren't your leaders on your team, not just the coaches, aren't the leaders on the team supposed to inspire and lift up the other guys on the team? And it just did not seem like that was happening all that much. Success is playing beyond your abilities, right? Leadership is about inspiring uh, guys to play with confidence and to overcome their circumstances. And it just didn't feel like that was um, fully there for the Braves. Maybe I'm being too hard on them, but uh, that's just my perspective. Um, and I think this is where losing 
uh, Wash, losing Ron Washington, losing Eric Young Sr. was most obvious to me, and, and I think especially Ron Washington. It's impossible to know what his impact would have been on this team, but man, I would have loved for him to be on this team and to say the things he would say. You know, he is both inspiring and will kick you in the pants. And I think, you know, both of those things were needed a little bit more from this team. You know, we, we praise Snicker uh, as he's like, you know, we say that Snicker is great at making sure that guys don't get too high and don't get too low. Um, and that's true. But sometimes I'm like, yeah, but I want them to get high. I, you know, I want them to get, uh, you know, <laughs> high emotionally. <laughs> I'll be specific. I want them to get high emotionally. I don't want them to get low emotionally. But um, it sometimes you want them to, you know, to take it up a notch. And um, it does seem that it's just kind of flatlined, uh, kind of somewhere in the middle. And again, I, I think oftentimes throughout the course of a regular season, that's a very positive thing. Bobby Cox was much the same. Um, and the Braves seem to have mastered in many ways the regular season, but not mastered the playoffs with that attitude. Um, so I appreciate that. This team is full of hard workers. I mentioned that a lot. You know, they they have good attitudes. I think there's a bunch of good guys on this team. I do love the makeup of this team generally, uh, but the combination of a little bit more inspiration from the coaching staff and a kick in the pants, just like Ron Washington would provide, would be very healthy for this team. Again, maybe maybe nothing would change if Ron Washington were still in that dugout, but I feel like he would have probably uh, taken a, a different tact um, at some point uh, and provide a little more inspiration for this team. So if I'm the Braves, I'm certainly looking for a coach that is going to bring some of uh, what Ron Washington brought to the table, some of his best qualities to the team. Uh, it's also important to mention with uh, the firing of Kevin Seitzer that Chipper Jones took to uh, Twitter to defend Seitzer. Of course, Chipper had these comments on the Corey Kluber podcast not too long ago, uh, really, uh, you know, criticizing the Braves organizationally for their uh, their hitting philosophy that, that, you know, they're just basically leaning totally on slug. And he wanted to make it very clear on Twitter that Seitzer is a great coach and is generally in his camp in terms of his philosophy. But, but certainly Seitzer is kind of a, a servant to the Braves hierarchy uh, organization, Anthopolis, whoever is setting that organizational philosophy. Seitzer has to go out and and do that and do what they're asking of him. So so Chipper relayed, you know, that all of his comments, they were not mean, mean to throw anyone under the bus, uh, that he is a big fan of Seitzer and Bobby Magallanes. Um, but yeah, the strategy of slug over everything else, it certainly comes from the top. It's coming from the analytics department of the Braves, right? They have made a conscious decision to go for slug over everything else. And of course, that really, uh, that strategy craters when half of your, um, you know, slugging offense gets injured. Um, but it is it is statistically advantageous to go for pure slug in the regular season. I would say that that really stops being true in the playoffs. I mean, we just saw home runs are awesome and they can totally change the game. We saw that in the 2021 postseason for the Braves, though they also won games uh, without hitting home runs. Uh, you kind of need both, right? You need both in the postseason, especially against some of the greater pitchers. But you just saw last night with Cleveland. I mean, they they saved their season with a couple of big home runs. So home runs are good. They're important. Uh, you know, we love them. They're fun. They're awesome. Uh, the Solaire home run is iconic. You know, the Braves uh, had so many big home runs in that 2021 uh, postseason, uh, the the Rosario home run against the Dodgers, right? Uh, Freddie's home run uh, against the Brewers, against Hater. I mean, they're big and they're important, uh, and they can impact the game suddenly. But again, you go through that postseason, you go through most teams that win the World Series. They're going to have games where they they aren't able to slug because of great pitching, and you just got to squeeze out a couple runs here and there, or just that one run in the middle of the game you know, a two out single that gets a guy in from third might be the difference ultimately. So 
they're both important, right? Especially in the postseason. Whereas I think in the regular season, slug can carry you through and you're going to have uh, more wins than losses if you just have a team that can slug really well. Um, but here's the thing, you know, slug works better when you can um, operate in hitters counts um, and when you put more pressure on the pitcher by getting runners on base. And you think about it, the Braves didn't either of those things very well this year. Um, you know, their on-base percentage way down, uh, taking walks, being patient in counts was not as good. I mean, it just seemed like the Braves were constantly in pitcher's counts, 0-2, 1-2 counts, and you're just not going to get good pitches to hit more often than, than not in those counts. Uh, you, you, want pitch, you want runners on base, right? You want to raise the pitcher's stress level as much as you can. Hard fought at bats, right? Get to eight, nine, ten pitch at bats. Foul, foul pitches off. Take your walks. Get hits. Get runners on base. Um, get some speed on base, right? And put some pressure on them that way and steal some bases. All of this pressures the pitcher, and it just seemed like the entire season the Braves were not putting any pressure on pitchers. In fact, I think they were making them more comfortable. Swing and miss, strikeouts, pitchers you know that are that you're going against are getting more confident and then it's just harder to manufacture anything from there and i think this was this is particularly true you know in uh you know it's it's exposed more um when you don't have an elite hitter in the middle of your lineup like you know the Braves for so long i've mentioned this before they were able to kind of lean on freddie freeman in the middle of that lineup and then when freddie left they lean on ronald acuña they have two of the greatest hitters in baseball in their lineup and everybody kind of, you know, does what they, they do. It's, it's, they're leading by example. They're, they're, you know, patient at the plate. They're taking walks really high on base percentage, all those things on top of the power that they provide. And, you know, when all of that's taken away in 2024, uh, you just don't have that. And then Ronald, I mean, the, the extra level of greatness of Ronald Acuna is he can also get on base and again, his speed and his his threat to steal bases puts even greater pressure on the pitcher. And on top of that, what the Braves were able to do in 2023 is they did it all in the first inning, right? So you're immediately jumping on the opponent and making them uncomfortable. And again, I think generally speaking, the Braves offense uh, was not able to do that in 2024 so you know their super aggressive approach again leads to more strikeouts they put up a little resistance uh to the pitcher this is why you know oftentimes they're facing a pitcher that has been terrible all year and they suddenly make this pitcher look great uh, they increase the opposing pitcher's confidence with swing and miss and with strikeouts and no speed on the base paths no stress to the pitcher so I, they have to flip that script in 2025 they have to get back to more patience at the plate to getting speed on the base pass maybe you need to go out and get somebody else with a little a little bit of speed uh that that can you know add that element back and hopefully ronald can can come back and do that as well uh so just kind of in in this episode with this thought you know while i don't think the firing of kevin seitzer is necessarily the ultimate answer i, I don't disagree with it either you know new blood a new voice might help the team, but ultimately, I think the Braves have to get healthy. I think they probably have to shift their hitting philosophy. I think they have to do a better job in prepping in the offseason and in spring training to get everybody ready to go with their correct hitting approach and batting stance and mechanics. Um, and I think Alex also needs to uh, probably bring in a player or two that can impact the team offensively. And again, I'd love what Frank Gore is saying, bringing a new shortstop, bringing some new blood. Bo Bichette sounds great to me. He certainly would be an improvement to Orlando Arcia. So I uh, wish the best for Kevin Seitzer. I mean, 10 years as the Braves hitting coach, I think he did a lot of great things. Um, but yeah, 2024 was disappointing. I'm sure it was disappointing to him as well, but wish him all the best. And certainly, I uh, wish the Braves the best as this offseason is getting closer and closer. We have Cleveland saving their season last night. They're down 2-1 to one to the Yankees. Uh, and then uh, the Dodgers are just one game away from the World Series as they are three games to one on the Mets. So it's kind of looking like a Dodgers-Yankees series. I'm sure Major League Baseball will be very happy for that. But I'm kind of rooting for the, the Guardians at this point, guys. So we'll see what happens. Uh, and... Uh, 
yeah, then get into get fully into the offseason, get things rolling for the Braves and the rest of baseball again. So, all right, well, thanks for tuning into this episode of Stay the Braves. Guys, I'll talk to you soon.